thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here and get to speak to you. I'm also somewhat daunted because I feel like I sort of have to represent all of those computer architects um, since I am talking about computing performance and, um, and, and what, what it has taken to stay on Moore's Law and to actually get performance benefits out of Moore's Law. Um, I, I decided to just, before I talk about science, which is really the, where I'm going to mainly talk about the impacts of that performance growth, um, I want to talk about some of the other applications we heard about this morning. So going back to Jeanette's story from this morning, um, if we roll back in time 20 years, um, or be, be pre-1990 even, to um, a point where computers had the performance they did, where we had all of the innovations in algorithms, in software, in um, tech creative ideas for how to use computer that we've heard about throughout the day, um, I woke up this morning um, and I decided I wanted to access my, uh, my gigahertz uh, a processor and it was a, a Cray YMP sitting in bed with me, which is, uh, fortunately it was designed to be a little bit li li smaller than the previous generations of Crays. It weighs under a ton, but it's still a fairly uh, dominant force there in the bed. And, um, and then I decided I wanted to do a, a Google search, um, but the networks are really not up to the kind of bandwidth that I wanted to get because I wanted to search for images. So I'm going to drive to my local Google center. Um, of course, that, that Google center is requiring tens of, of gigawatts of power to get the kind of computing performance. And uh, because Google is a very green company, they put this by a hydro dam, the one that I think might possibly have provided enough performances in China at Three Gorges um, Dam. So this is, uh, you know, the, it is about computing performance hardware, the energy efficiency of hardware, in addition to all the innovations that, of course, have been absolutely critical in getting the kind of applications that we've heard about today. So um, I'm going to talk here. Well, let's get my clicker. Um, though a little bit about high performance at, in um, science, uh, what it has done for science, and also what the, some of the challenges are in, in continuing to increase computing performance that we need um, for the future innovations in science. I'm going to really talk about three different classes of problems and just give you an example. These are, these are taken from the DOE space, uh, Department of Energy space, and they're taken specifically from things that were done um, on the computers that are used at the NERSC Center. But I'm going to talk about science at the largest scale. So enormous problems that use some of the largest petascale systems that we have today. Um, then I'm going to talk about more of the volume problem of computing, that is, where you want to run massive amounts of, um, ma massive numbers of simulations um, in order to get, make a scientific discovery, and then finally say something about data. So this first um, example is taken from combustion simulation. Um, it is maybe something a little harder for most of us to get our, our hands around than something like a, a Google search or reading your email. Um, but it's really about designing very energy efficient devices in order to generate power. Um, and what you see there is, I think I, I picked this example in part because I think it's a great example of the three pillars of science working together. The picture of the scientist there is an experimentalist, Robert Chang at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, um, who's designed something called low swirl burners. Um, these are very energy efficient, low emissions burners that he designed, partly inspired, by the way, by his dryer. So it was about how you, how you uh, make enough heat in order to dry your clothes. And you can see from the right hand pictures um, that they come in all different scales. So he's actually licensed some of this technology to industry. Um, and they are, um, you can, you, they're small enough to hold in your hand or industrial scale burners um, to create large uh, amounts of, of heat. And so, the, um, but, but they're trying to understand how to move these kinds of burners into alternative fuels and um, really understand the process of combustion and exactly how to design the burner for the, the fuel injectors and things to, to maximize their energy efficiency. And the simulation there that you see in the left um, is one of these low swirl burners. This was done by John Bell, who's an applied mathematician. That simulation requires advanced math and advanced algorithms. In fact, it was one of the examples that David gave in his slide. Um, and, but what this really allows them to do is slow down the burning process so you can see exactly what's happening. And there are features in this that you can't see actually in the, in the lab. Um, they, they, can, they run these simulations today on some of the largest petascale systems, such as the da Jaguar system at Oak Ridge National Labs, as well as the NERF systems. Um, but they need exascale computing to, to put all of the chemistry in to understand all the alternative fuels that we want to develop. The second example is um, computing in volume. Um, and this is used for everything from screening from diseases to batteries. Um, an example from the um, University of Washington, Valerie Daggett's group has a project, uh, the Dynamiomics uh, Database, which is to improve the understanding of um, basic uh, structures like proteins. And um, she ran 10,000 simulations in the nurse systems. 
and has used these to understand some of the basics of, um, of drug design. That is, they, what, they're, what they actually stored now in this database um, is all of those 10,000, 11,000 simulations, but it's not just the result of how the proteins fold, it's the actual dynamics. So think about storing, it's basically a Netflix database of um, protein unfoldings, um, which is what the simulations are. And they've been able to understand something about the common patterns and how these fold uh, um, that are behind things like um, Alzheimer's disease. The, the example on the right is a project that um, has been done by Gert Seeder at MIT um, and Kristen Pearson at Berkeley Lab, and it's the Materials Genome Project. It's the idea of simulating massive numbers of things, in this case applied to the problem of designing more um, energy efficient um, and useful and with lo long life batteries. Um, the, the goal here is actually to improve uh, the, the productivity of companies um, that are making these batteries by cutting in half the about 18 years that it takes from the design of a new material that could be used in a battery to, it, to its use in manufacturing. So it's trying to shrink that by uh, about 50%. They simulated in this particular case 20,000 batteries. I won't go into the details of what's in the graph, but it shows you kind of where current batteries are at. And what this does is that lower right quadrant is the place where there's interesting materials. So you can, you can narrow down your space of interesting problems by doing massive numbers of simulations. They asked for um, a startup account um, at NERSC and um, they put in their request for next year. It was, a, it was a fifth of all of the computing that we have at NERSC. I said, I'm sorry, I can't quite um, give you that much computing time, but it, it gives you an indication. And they, by the way, they, they would like ab about 10,000 times more computing to solve, um, to put all of these materials into realistic uh, situations. So once again, an exascale volume problem. The last example, um, is, starts with the, the Nobel Prize story from 2011. This is a picture of Saul Perlmutter, um, who won the Nobel Prize in, uh, in physics, so one was, was one of the winners. Um, and this was using type 1A supernova to, to um, measure, use a standard candle to measurement devices to understand the expansion of the universe and the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. This was based on simulation. So how, how do we know what supernovas are supposed to look like from the Earth? Well, in the late 90s, um, they did simulations of what they were supposed to look like, and that allowed them to use those as, as these standard candles or measurement devices. More recently, a problem that's even more data intensive um, is looking at, uh, it was a discovery of a nearby supernova. Peter Nugent, um, who also works at the lab, um, had, had made this discovery when he, we had, uh, I think not coincidentally, made a, um, an upgrade to the global file system at the center um, that allowed them to sift through the data much more efficiently than they had. And they, they, they look at, they produce about 300 gigabytes per night of data um, sent through, through the ESNet network um, to the NERSC Center. Um, there are machine le learning algorithms that sift through that data and look for things that look like interesting features that might or might not be supernova. Peter then was looking at these one night um, on this more this optimized file system and realized that it was something that looked like a supernova. He was able, he, he happened to see that within hours of its initial explosion, which is the earliest, so even though it's 10 million light years away, and of course it happened a long time ago, um, it, uh, it, it allows him to capture what's a very short window of a couple of weeks, and they redirected telescopes in order to get a never seen before picture of what that supernova looks like early in its explosion. The, um, I think NIDRD has really moved scientists through some difficult technology um, transitions and have more of that to do um, as we look forward. This is um, also looking at some of those numbers from the Gordon Bell Prizes. These are applica scientific applications running at very large scale on some of the largest systems in the world um, and just kind of showing you um, what happened. Well, well, what did things look like in the early 90s? Well, something really dramatic happened, um, which was what we sometimes refer to as attack of the killer micros. So those pictures on the bottom left, some of those are Cray systems, like the, the large supercomputers, vector supercomputers, which were designed specifically to do large scale scientific simulation problems. And um, these killer micros, of course, came in, which was both an opportunity to have more cost-effective way of building these systems, but also really a, a crisis for the, the scientific computing um, people who were trying to write the software because it completely changed the way you write the software. So let's look a little bit. This is data now from the top 500 list looking at, um, it's a great historical reference for what some of these fast machines in the world look like. So the fastest 500 machines um, that are reported at least in the top 500 list. Um, and what I'm looking at here is what is the processor technology that is used within, each, within these um, high performance computing systems. And um, over this roughly 20 year, 18 year time span, um, 
in which Schneider D has been doing a lot of this, this research. So on the left-hand side, you see that the chart is dominated by these red colored, which are, which are uh, vector processors, shared memory multiprocessors, so single processor systems, and small shared memory SMP systems made out of vector processors. Those dominated the fastest machines in the world at that time. On the right-hand side, they're completely gone, and everything is either a cluster or a massively parallel system, which is basically a cluster with a more um, highly optimized um, network designed uh, specifically for uh, um, uh, massively, massive parallelism. So in that same period of time, the number of industrial machines on that list went from 25% of the list to 50% of the list. So we can see that this has had a real impact on um, the use of large-scale computing um, in industry because these, were, these machines were now much more accessible from a hardware standpoint. It's much easier to go out and buy a cluster. Um, however, there was still um, there, there was a big problem, which is how to program them. So the other way to look at this is that, very roughly speaking, those early systems were programmed by annotating um, serial programs, and um, whereas the new systems had to be programmed by completely rethinking the algorithms and the software for parallelism and message passing. So um, David mentioned the MPI um, uh, library, the interface, which is one of the things that NIDRD has made a number of investments in. Um, this, this effort and the standardization effort was um, first started in 1992. They did the first release of an MPI implementation in 1994. It involved 80 people from 40 organizations spread throughout the, um, the government and throughout the world. It scales to millions of processors today with separate memory spaces, so it's very scalable and it's very portable. It's allowed, um, a, a, it, you can use multiple programming languages. In fact, when we look at NERSC, many people are using multiple languages in their large-scale scientific applications. Very complex applications that often tie together these libraries as well as simulations that came from different communities into a multi-physics simulation. And billions of dollars of um, applications have been developed. And of course, it's not over as this, the systems continue to involve evolve, the MPI implementation uh, or the standardization effort um, has to evolve as well. Now, the, um, programming, the programming challenges here, and this is just kind of giving you a summary of a number of different um, scientific libraries that were built by NIDRD funded projects um, from the agencies, and it includes, uh, I looked at how many of these applications are used in some of the, the NERSC workloads. We have 4,000 users at NERSC, about 500 different projects, and those projects, about 35% of them, for example, use the LAPAC Linear Algebra Library funded by NSF and later funded by DOE. Um, the PETC library that David already mentioned, FFTW, which came from MIT, also had fu funding from, um, from those agencies. Uh, I mean, a number of these different libraries, I won't go into details, but, but this really allowed people, the, the MPI basis and then the libraries that were built onto it that have some of the, mo the state-of-the-art algorithms encoded into those libraries um, is, have really fueled a, a lot of these applications that you saw earlier. Um, I will just say that, that MPI is not the only kind of innovation that came up in basic programming. Um, MPI is mostly used for these problems that you can decompose, a physical simulation problem that you can de decompose into these different parts, um, as which you see in the images on the left. For some of the problems that come up in security applications and come up in some of the kinds of social graph analytics problems that, that we're trying to solve today, um, and have actually been trying to solve for a number of years, there's a very high random access problem problem that comes up. That is, you want to just sort of grab any data anywhere across the machine. Um, uh, Bill Carlson calls this the just do it sort of phenomena of programming. Sometimes even though it's very expensive to grab eight bytes of data across the network that's all the way across the machine, you, you just need to do it. Um, and so some, a number of languages, um, including languages I've worked on, but also things that were funded by DARPA and the HPCS program, X10, Chapel, and Fortress, have all been um, based on this kind of model to make it easier for people to write these kinds of programs that don't easily decompose. In some sense, what you're trying to do there is find the structure that doesn't already exist a priori. So um, going back to looking at this, this graph of performance growth, of course, the, um, the other major thing that happened was in 2004, the rest of the world got, compute, got, got parallelism. And people looked to the, um, the expertise and the, the people that suddenly it became very hard to hang on to your experts in parallel programming because everybody wanted to hire them. It was no longer just something for scientific and engineering um, disciplines. And, um, now, as we look forward, there's a question about how are we going to get to an exascale, and the question I have here is, is are we going to see something like the attack of the killer cell phones between now and then? We really need to make these systems more energy efficient and therefore uh, maybe looking at these kinds of cell phone devices. 
So many of you people in this room, of course, are very familiar with what Moore's Law really is, which is about transistor density. It is not about performance. And of course, what, uh, but it, and Moore's Law is alive and well today, um, and it looks like it'll go forward for at least close to another decade. Um, but the uh, clock speed frequencies have not continued with Moore's Law. And in 2004, something very dramatic happened where basically the clock speeds leveled off. And the reason they did that was because of power density. Your laptop is now too hot to hold on your lap for long periods of time. Um, and that is the same problem that we see when we build large scale systems. Um, instead, what we're seeing is a growth in the number of cores per processor. And so the scientific community, along with everybody else, has, have had to deal with this particular problem. So at the very large scale, what does this, this power density problem translate into? Well, it also translates into a problem for those of us who are facilities directors. Um, these are megawatts of computing facilities, whether you're talking about a cloud facility um, used for a wide variety of applications, or you're talking about a high performance scientific computing with systems and networks optimized for science and tightly coupled problems. The problem is um, really how do you build more computing performance for uh, the scientific, uh, for the entire computing community? And it's, um, you know, a, a, we've got a petaflop machine. It's about three megawatts at NERSC. If we were to try to build an exaflop with that um, technology today, it would require um, about three gigawatts, of course, of power. But if, if we speculate out to what Moore's Law will give us in terms of energy efficiency improvements, it's still about 130 to 200 megawatts. And so this is really the problem we have going forward. And it's not just about how to build the largest system, but about how to build all the systems. The inspiration then of cell phone processors as very energy efficient devices, graphics processors also very energy efficient, are really going to change the na nature of computer architecture. And there's a lot of research that has to be done to figure out how can we leverage these kinds of devices. Anybody who thinks that this problem is solved or is kind of a, on an obvious path just needs to look at the, what I think of as the chaos right now in the computer architecture industry in terms of what is going to be the way of getting more performance going forward with graphics processors and others. The real problem is uh, also then, besides redesigning the hardware, we need to do, redo the software and algorithms. This graph looks at the amount of energy used to do various operations. Um, communication is the thing that's important. Computation from both a time and a um, energy perspective is relatively free. Um, and so the, the conclusion from that is contrary to what your spouse tells you, uh, stop communicating. And I will end with um, just a, a cover of a National Academy's report, uh, NRC report that, that I was involved with. Um, I think uh, Bob Cole and others were involved with this. It was on computing performance, game over, or next level. Um, Sam Fuller, who led that, um, that, that study, calls this graph the expectation gap graph. It says that as things turned over, everybody, I think everybody in this room implicitly assumed that computing performance will continue to go up um, with Moore's Law. But there is going to be a lot of work, even more than there were, was in the last 20 years, um, to make that happen in the next 20 years. Thank you. We have time for a quick question for Kathy. So um, I, I understand completely the kind of problem that you're dealing with when you're trying to scale to more machines and volume and the like. But I'm wondering if you've had any examples that you could cite where the solution to progress um, was more in the line of doing not so much even special purpose uh, uh, application specific chips or things like that, but literally machines that might do the computation We've had several examples where we've dealt with uh, physical things that involve thousands or millions of independent things that had to be controlled, and where a device was a better solution to it than a computational approach in the normal sense of that term. Have you had any of those examples? And if so, could you share some with us? Well, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's uh, exactly what you're referring to, but we have looked at the problem of how would we design a computer system specifically for science. And um, not so much because we think we're going to go and, and build that thing, but because it tells us a lot about what we can and can't use. We have a, had a project called Green Flash, which looks at using these kind of cell phone processors and tailoring them to scientific um, simulations. And you can get much more energy efficient um, and powerful systems by doing that than you can by using kind of commodity x86 sort of processors, even if you scale those forward in time. I, I think that um, you know, we are going to also see, I think, more specialization on the chip um, at, for, for different kinds of application domains and trying to figure out how to take advantage of that and how the scientific community takes advantage of what the rest of the world is going to do, um, I think is, is one of our big challenges as well.